now Simona Bonfante, I understand, is going to chair. Bene, a te la parola. Hello, everybody. We are now going to talk about digital rights, or at least some of them. Actually, this, this session is um, well, has to do with digital monopolies, but also with everyone's fundamental rights. Now under threat by an invasive technology, an irresponsible industry, and a lack of adequate rules. Can citizens be able to change this? Well, we are going to talk about that. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists, uh, who are Maria Luisa Stasi, a senior legal officer with Article 19. Just a reminder, that Article 19 is a human rights organization focused on freedom of expression and of information. And this is quite peculiar. The name is after the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Very welcome, and thanks for being here. Then we have uh, Yannick Blanchk. Voila. Ciao. From the Joint Research Center. Uh, which is the Commission's Science and Knowledge Service, providing independent scientific advice and support to EU policy. Thanks for being here. You too, Yannick. Then we have Andrea Andreoli, who is an activist with humans, engaged in an interoperability easy eye open project. We, he's going to talk about that. And then we have also this uh, was not expected, actually, he is, but he's very, very welcome. Innocenzo Genna, who also is, is a legal uh, advisor, is an expert with the subject we are going to talk, one of the subjects, which is interoperability. Then we should have also um, Marco Ciurcina, who is an activist with the Pirate Party in Italy. I think he is not here in person, but he should be with us in video. And Marco Ciurcina is one of the promoters of an easy eye for the legalization of file sharing. I'm Simona Bonfante, I'm a freelance journalist and an activist, but someone calls me, uh, calls me a Taliban for the digital rights with humans. Uh, I would like to start with Maria Luisa, if you're ready. Right. Sì. Question. Okay. Sorry. Um, well, I'll start with, uh, first, first with things first, uh, thanking you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to share um, a couple of thoughts about this topic, but especially to hear what others have to say. Uh, I feel this is a very much a collective effort, so uh, we need to kind of reinforce uh, our messages and uh, also uh, because what we're facing uh, are very complex issues, it's also very good to do some brain common brainstorming. Uh, what I would like to do in the next couple of minutes is just uh, to set a little bit the scene, also for the others to contribute, and provide you with uh, what can be one of the approaches. I don't uh, pretend to be uh, telling you the only approach possible, but I'll try to to explain why for a digital rights organization, or for an organization that deals with human rights and also on the digital sphere, this might be one of the mon most functional approaches, uh, which includes uh, interoperability, but uh, the idea is to first set the scene and then explain which kind of role we see interoperability could play and why it's um, an instrument that has some advantages towards other possible solutions. So the idea is simple. And it's uh, on all newspapers and it impacts all of us. Uh, the digital sector is evolving in a way that is highly concentrated. We have an, a few digital platforms that dominate uh, a lot of markets. Um, the services they provide, they're, they're way more invasive of, of our private sphere than they used to be offline, uh, at least, you know, uh, for the majority of cases. Um, so we do have a number of harms, let's say, or a number of challenges or problems or market failures. We can call them in a different way depending on which kind of lens we're going to put on to identify the problem. I don't think that any of these ways is an alternative, but they are all cumulative to, be to have a better understanding. So if we talk, for example, about, um, you know, I try to use kind of a neutral language. 
uh, but it's easy to talk about loss of choices for consumers that are or users or citizens, as I like to define them, because they're kind of locked in in number of uh, uh, in using. Uh, very, very few of these platforms. Uh, we have a problem of control, surveillance, uh, protection of our private sphere. We have maybe also a problem, uh, well, strong problem of uh, the quality of these services being uh, lower and lower because there is no competitive pressure on these platforms. Uh, and we also have, we can argue, we have a problem with less innovation. Because if, my, if there is no competitive pressure, these platforms, they don't feel any pressure to innovate, right? They're fine with, you know, if we don't have choice, we cannot select other products then, or services. They don't have any incentive to innovate. So all this means that we have a number of issues. It's not only one issue. From a digital rights perspective, we have problems with data protection and privacy. There is a big hype on that, and I'm very much uh, welcoming this hype, but I, I think it's not the only one. We have, depending on the service we're focusing on, we have a number of other fundamental rights at stake. For sure, free speech, and this is you know my privileged perspective. Uh, the way content is moderated online, which kind of content I can access, which kind of content I can share, um, is um, as a fundamental impact on my free expression as an individual, but also as a, a fundamental impact on, on free expression uh, on a collective level. So how much people uh, can be uh, collectively manipulated, how much the public discourse is actually free for everyone to uh, intervene or is kind of driven by actors, uh, whoever they be. Uh, then we have another big problem for non-discrimination, for example. Uh, all this use of algorithm uh, and automated system by platforms uh, is kind of obscure, there is not much transparency and we the, the little research that is available because of the little data that are available shows already that there is a lot of there are a lot of problems of uh, of uh, discriminating different groups usually vulnerable groups uh, I could go on so what my, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, what happens in those markets impacts potentially uh, a long list of human rights so we need to find a solution a solution that needs to be uh, possibly comprehensive, but I doubt that there is one single instrument we can use. Although there are some instruments that might be uh, uh, more efficient uh, for these um, intertwined problems and others that they might focus on, on a specific problem but create, create trade-off for others. So um, we've been listening a lot about calls for interoperability. I will leave other people uh, more technical than I am with a lot of technical knowledge uh, to explain you what we mean technically by that. But from a policy perspective, I think that interoperability uh, could be one of the best instruments because if we want to fix all these problems we have, we need a vision. We need a vision of, of you know, what's the end game? Where we gonna, where we wanna get? What we wanna achieve? Uh, we wanna solve a specific issue, or we wanna think in the long term and have open, fair markets with innovation, many players. Possibly those players should use a business model that is kind of human rights compliant, etc. So if this is the vision, then having a very invasive regulatory approach might not fit for purpose. Because the moment that technology changes or the moment the business model changes, then you need to reinvent all the will for, from the regulatory perspective. So what I'm trying to say is that we should kind of try to, to find solutions that lay the, the ground for a different dynamic in the market, rather than fixing a specific problem and waiting for a next problem to, to show up. So that's why interoperability, I think, it, it, it works, because is, um, if, if we manage to pass the idea that the sector in general needs to adopt interoperability as a default, let's say, or as a standard, then what we're going to do, we're going to put down a lot of barriers to entry for competitors. We're going to see more, more startups, more uh, actors in the market uh, providing different services, so providing choices for consumers, uh, for, as I said, for citizens is a better term uh, for me. Um, and also possibly competing on the quality of their services. We also might have, as citizens, some leverage uh, in you know, choosing the provider that we like the most. And this provider will need to have, uh, if, if there is interoperability in the market, they will have uh, a way in. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that um, 
interoperability can be a good choice because it can kind of uh, uh, lay the ground for a different uh, um, a different market dynamic for opening the market and as an end game as in the long term also for uh, raising the quality of products and uh, having more respect for fundamental rights. Because Article 19 is also an international organization, we don't work only and exclusively in Europe. There is another advantage that I would like to share with you, just to see you know, what do you think. Uh, it might not be extremely relevant for the European Union, although this is questionable, um, is that if we rely on invasive regulation, I mean, the, many, many of these um, digital platforms, they announce our free expression, for example, or uh, they uh, can undermine our privacy. Now, I am not happy if a private company does that, but I'm not happy either to allow the state to decide, uh, to, to go on with a very invasive regulation um, that decide, uh, Again, which kind of information I should access, which kind of information I sh should share, uh, what is the hate speech or uh, the criticism that is tolerated in society and what is not tolerated, uh, which kind of content can be labeled as terrorist content and it should be shared, not even for research purposes. So I'm a little bit reluctant to leave this door open, either to big companies or to states. I would prefer to think about a possibility for markets to offer more choices for consumers rather than to set boundaries and limits. So in a way, what I think is that if we build walls, we're not going to go as far as if we build bridges. So that's more or less my approach. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. The point I think is that there's no transparency. Private algorithms are not open to, you know, even to an inquiry, if I just want to know which are the criteria for them to choose the content I can see or why content I post is not seen by the others, I would never know. So this is another point, but I don't want to uh, do any question now. I want to leave some room afterwards. And I would give now uh, the floor to Andrea Andreoli, who is Yes, among the promoters of so a study, an open project for introducing the interoperability in, among digital platforms. Let's listen to him. Thank you. My name is Andrea Andreoli. I work in IT engineer and I followed this first um, first part of uh, setting up uh, the interoperability ACI. I'm pretty fond of this um, This direction has been taken, the, the, the work, because uh, I think that can sum up uh, uh, different political uh, positioning. Uh, this uh, You can either be a free market or not. Uh, you probably agree on the strong need of competition between uh, um, digital services. So we as you already understood, we space between different uh, matters, market regulation, so the economic impact, content moderation, Maria Luisa told us, and um, all of this um, problem with the content filtering and the algorithmic or not algorithmic um, uh, targeting, because as a matter of fact, we should uh, think about the fact that uh, this um, targeting engines are probably uh, rather than algorithm are neural networks so artificial intelligence that actually are not exactly algorithm uh, they accumulate experience and they take some decision upon how to target how to target uh, content and uh, this has some implications because you actually it, it's could not be so easy to to see their responsibility under this uh, this operation anyway uh, beyond this uh, the fact of uh, ownership of data and uh, last but not least but we are not going deep in this the problem of the taxation of this uh, giant because um, it's something that has been really discussed um, interoperability has actually a strong history uh, of success, I would say, in um, in other markets, in European and Union, uh, Union in particular. Uh, we 
for instance, we use uh, as uh, an example um, the the history of uh, um, the mobile phone networks uh, that has been uh, developing in Europe after other markets, after United States, for instance. And the in, in United States started with. Uh, very strong uh, and uh, local monopolies, so you succeeded to have uh, one phone in New York and not able to try uh, to use it in when, when in Boston. And then uh, what happened actually in Europe is uh, that lots of companies uh, involved in that market has been taken around a table and developed protocols. That's actually what, uh, from the technical point of view, uh, has been done to to spawn uh, um, GSM and GSM, uh, or at least the interoperable market has, as I said, a, a, an enormous quantity of, of advantages for uh, consumers. Um, that's uh, that's so clear. Um, the effort of uh, developing this this work has been done with uh, some friends like uh, Stefano Quintarelli, um, former member of Italian Parliament, who developed some lots of proposal, interesting proposal. One in particular was about uh, competition and protection of citizen and consumers on digital market. Uh, Innocenzo Gen as well, uh, who is being uh, reaching us uh, and uh, helped us to, to, to set up part of the, of the text of the um, uh, ACI. Uh, the European Commission has been known to actually seems to be uh, pretty determined to to study the issue and to define uh, a regulatory framework uh, to actually protect uh, and empower users so feeling that no protection and no empowerment has been given to users right now um, and um, uh, and to as well ensure uh, cooperation and public oversight. This is uh, something uh, or also uh, pretty new. Um, the monopoly, the monopoly situation that that we are facing now has been uh, actually um, has been born mainly f coming from the network effect. Network effect is that. Um, effect for the that brings a service to increase its value in proportion of the numbers numbers of user and with some uh, services like social media or uh, or uh, some messaging the the effect has been huge because uh, all of the, the almost the whole globe had to to um, uh, to 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 use uh, those uh, those uh, services uh, after a while ha had left no other chance than applying uh, to for the dominant service uh, to the consumer um, european citizen has been exposed to this situation but actually this monopolitic situation had different of of course um, places we it, it's been born in a way in the United States where the uh, United States has a strong tradition of uh, antitrust regulation but it seemed to in the last uh, say 15 years to abdicate all the, the powers. Uh, what actually happened is that uh, the digital dominance has been uh, completely left to the uh, I mean, happened without uh, uh, any any regula uh, regulatory um, judgment has been uh, done, has been made. I mean, uh, they choose to let all the market shares in a few hands. No question has been raising uh, toward uh, the big quantity of acquisition uh, that has been done in the years. On the other side, China. Uh, China has a, a different kind of uh, concentration, but is a total concentration as functional to the state-driven economy and, uh, of course, as we know, to the total control of the citizen. 
Um, so we have lack of consumer protection, lack of concentration, uh, sorry, concentration of, uh, of pri private data and uh, a strong intermediation of the information. Here you can uh, see the, the text of the ACI, uh, which is actually drafting um, of the drafting uh, version. And uh, we had some, uh, uh, maybe there's some issue that sh should still be defined to whether to ask all the players um, in a certain digital market to comply or uh, to ask all, only the dominant player to comply to this interoperability, leaving new entrants a certain advantage to reach the market for a certain period. And uh, this is more or less the point that we reached up to now. Innocenzo, if you want to add anything on the topic. Okay, that's the difference between a lawyer and an engineer, no, you see. No, and, um, no uh, thanks. I um, was very delighted to be involved in this discussion. I'm an expert in European regulation. I normally work for corporations, though this never uh, uh, prevented me to, to have uh, my personal opinion, even when my, my clients uh, were doing something else. That's happened especially for in the net neutrality debate, but even in copyright. Um, I stress in that uh, I work with corporation just to tell you that uh, I can give you some insight of how some aspects are debated and seen in the, in the business area. I'm very interested about this idea of interoperability, uh, especially as a, a way to tackle dominance of online platform. Uh, I'm a bit more uh, skeptical in making interoperability as a general rule for, uh, for the internet services uh, because uh, uh, it may not be very good for ISA for startup because sometimes there's a possibility to start with something new is, uh, um, is an advantage for uh, a new idea in your, in your business. So imposing interoperability from the right beginning for everyone maybe could not always be uh, a, a good idea. And in any case, we should not uh, confuse interoperability with standardization, which are two different things. They can go together, but not necessarily. On the other side, uh, interoperability for dominant platform seems to be, at this stage, a very good idea. Uh, maybe very important, of course, uh, also, uh, especially for messaging, because that is clear that wow, it interoperability, interoperability may work. So the possibility to give the possibility of different communication system to, to work together, starting from Skype to messages, WhatsApp and the others. And that will be uh, in somehow a, a, a solution to some network effect. Uh, it may be uh, important in general also for everything regarding the social activity. Uh, you, you make an example, now there is a, a huge debate uh, at European level about uh, uh, how to moderate content on the platform, uh, because content is um, sometimes tr is used in order to, to make, uh, to support terrorism, hate and so on. And uh, the legislator normally ask the social platform to take responsibility of the of that and try to make a moderation. But uh, the self regulation does not work very well because, as you know, I mean the social platform have the interest in having uh, a content uh, on their platform which create attention. And normally, the content which create attention is uh, the more disturbing. So if you put something wise, you don't get so many click. If you put something very aggressive, then all the people start to, uh, uh, to click, even if they don't agree with this, but just because it is a disturbing message. So uh, it is not in the interest of the social platform really to control this kind of content. So it may not be a good idea to ask them, I mean, to, to be the judge of this, how interoperability can work. If you find a way to make a new uh, uh, social network to interoperate with the dominant one, you may have the possibility for the users of Facebook others 
to be able to uh, leave uh, the dominant social network without losing uh, their connection, without losing their social life there, and uh, uh, remaining uh, uh, connected just for this connection, but then having their social life outside. This will be the possibility for people who want to be who want to keep this very large area of connection, but they are not interested, they don't want to feed uh, this uh, disturbing content, to make a choice. So not to continue to uh, somehow to support uh, uh, the fact that being in, uh, in, in the dominant platform, you somehow you are trapped and you even uh, um, contribute uh, to the to the strength of this platform because you are there with your data, with your activity, uh, which is profiled by the, by the platform, and then you are somehow, even if you don't agree, you contribute to this dominance. So interoperability will be, in this case, a possibility to, to give you the possibility to be cut out while not losing uh, uh, the main reason why you are uh, in, in, uh, on this platform, which are basically the, the, the connection. Because the more connection you have, this is the best place where you want to be. Uh, this is the idea. And uh, of course, it, 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 it is not easy. It will not be welcomed by dominant uh, social platform, but it could be uh, something that must be explored uh, and not easy, but on the other side, you have other alternatives which are not good in any case, because either you ask the dominant platform to be the moderator, and you know that they don't have an interest to be good moderator, or you have to ask the national authority to jump into this, and you cannot imagine the national authorities to be proactively and efficiently moderating what's happening on Facebook and so on. So the third way that we could uh, consider is interoperability. Thanks for. Thank you. This is just uh, a quick reply from uh, Maria Luisa. Please go. No, we have time. We are sorry. 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 All right. We don't have any time. So, Yannick, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having the European and, uh, Do I have to keep pressing this? Yeah. No, now it works. Okay, thank you so much uh, for having us. And from the outset, I have to apologize. I'm filling in for a colleague, uh, Gianluca Misuraka, uh, who is incredibly knowledgeable on AI and interoperability. And unfortunately, I cannot offer that. Uh, but what I can offer is some reflection on uh, three key topics that we've talk, uh, talked about today, which is the role of citizens in society, in the remnants of this platform, the, the role of online technologies, and then um, finally the role of science uh, in, in society. So I want to take that from the angle of a report that my unit uh, recently published. Uh, it's called Understanding Our Political Nature. And what we try to do is uh, have a look at how people do political decisions and what that uh, means for the process of how we design policy. And um, if I just uh, frame some, some key messages of that report uh, for the purpose of today's discussions and uh, perhaps also today's panel, is um, first of all that the framing of a policy problem is a very political rather than a technical issue. And it determine, and the determination of what research is needed, what research we um, include in the policy process, which research we ignore, is something that actually we should open up in the policy process much earlier than we're currently doing. The report we did together with um, scientists coming from all sorts of disciplines, neuroscience, uh, political science, pu public policy, economics, and um, they all gave us these recommendations and coming back to the, to the talk about opening up the policy process, uh, another, another issue that we have to be aware of in the way of how people perceive experts, how people perceive scientific evidence is that is not only about the reputation of the policymaker, the reputation of the scientist, is also how citizens perceive whether this person shares their values, shares their interests, and thus again opening up the, 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 the evidence collection process at a much earlier stage could actually increase the um, trust of citizens into the political process. And one way of 
contributing or, or, or increasing that effect could also be deliberative democracy. We've talked about it already in the beginning of uh, today and uh, heard some very inspiring initiatives today uh, in, in the remit of the European Citizens Initiative. Um, but we can, we can go even further than that and look at how, um, the way that uh, new digital deliberative platforms can actually shape uh, policy discussions and can support the way that citizens can bring themselves into the political uh, debate and inform public policymakers about their needs, their values, their emotions, and finally also the, the role of uh, scientific evidence and which scientific evidence they would like to see considered. So one practical example that we, for example, looked at in the remit of our report was a platform called V Taiwan. It's a um, collaborative pro uh, platform that was um, dis um, developed by the government of Taiwan following some serious political clashes in 2014. And following that, the government of Taiwan saw the need to, to reach out better to citizens, and what they developed was this platform. And the way it works is very different from what we know social media platforms. So it really maps where you stand in, a political, uh, in, in, in the political debate on, on your position. And it actu actually drives towards consensus. So it helps people to have a very nuanced discussion um, about, about, the, about the issue at stake. And it helped the government already to, uh, to have much more sensible uh, regulation initiatives, for example, on issues on how to regulate the gig economy, how to regulate Uber, and the government recently came up with a new platform that they call Join. And uh, it has already informed 20 out of uh, um, 26 cases that were these, uh, um, proposed on this platform have been put into the policy process. So when the willingness of policymakers is there to include this evidence and to, and to listen to what citizens and stakeholders have to say in a, in a way that actually makes sense out of a lot of contributions in, a, in, a, in an online platform, it can be something incredibly powerful that we can, uh, as policymakers at this point, really consider that could, that could help us reinvigorate our democracy. So this was just some very short um, key remarks uh, from the report. I have some uh, executive summaries and reports with me in case somebody's uh, interested to dive more in depth. And um, since we're already uh, quite out of time, I would uh, cut it short here. Thank you so much for the attention and thank you. Um, Virginia, do we have time to broadcast Marco's video? Uh, I think four minutes. So four minutes, so we can go. If it works. works. You're ready, Carlo? So he's a promoter of an easy eye um, for file sharing legalization. No, no value. Uh, All right. Go. Hi, Virginia. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Marco Ciurcina. I am a, a digital freedom activist. And with other friends, uh, many of us close to pirate parties all over Europe, are considering to uh, make, uh, well, we already established to make uh, a European uh, citizen initiative asking the Commission to take position on uh, uh, legalization of file sharing of works protected by copyright among individual persons. Uh, we do this uh, with the support of uh, uh, Italian Pirate Party and uh, uh, the Pirate Party of uh, Europe, the European Union, and uh, we do this uh, uh, as individuals, uh, we set uh, a committee, uh, we are ready to make the proposal. Uh, we do this because uh, we think uh, that uh, we are not satisfied with the results of the uh, directing, of, directing of co on copyright that was issued on uh, April uh, this year. Technologies that are available since many, many years that allow people to share.
mentioned directly among them works. So uh, avoiding to use in intermediaries, so interacting directly and gaining freedom. So uh, it's a, a long-standing battle and maybe at the origin of the pair of parties, in Sweden the pair of parties was created exactly to react to the legal battle that was made by uh, uh, copyright holders against the pair of day. So uh, raising this issue is going back to uh, an historic battle uh, fight for, for freedom in, in digital world. Uh, I, we decided to adopt this tec technique, the European Citizen Initiative, because it's the most useful tool to raise issues like this that has a large uh, base of people in favor. Uh, but no, uh, no feedback from the institutions. So we think we have to, uh, we think we are confident that using this uh, technique, the European Citizen Initiative, Basis. Um, the initiative we decided to find it uh, in, in the next year because the new uh, legislation is much more favorable, much more, uh, it has different advantages. One of them is the availability of the platform for a, for a collecting of signatures. The second and uh, maybe more relevant uh, point is the possibility to choose the moment All right. Since we are, you know, time is running out. I think you had already said the most important thing in, uh, on, on the initiative they are going to 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 take. Just one minute for a reply from Maria Luisa, if you still want to. Thanks. Yes, I can take even less if it's needed. It's just that talking about content moderation was, uh, you know, it's it's something that is on my desk every day. It's something we're struggling with. I couldn't agree more about the fact that interoperability can play a huge role there. What, I'm, what I would like to know, I'll, I'll throw another idea and I'll see if I can collect now or afterwards feedbacks, uh, they will be useful. Rather than having um, interoperability between different social media platforms, if we look at a social media platform, the social media platform like Facebook provides different services. There is hosting, and then there is content moderation, there is messaging, and there could be others, right? We have a problem with content moderation. We don't have a problem with hosting, really. We don't have a problem necessarily with messaging. So why don't we think, or could it be a possibility to think about interoperability, not for the entire platform, but for the content moderation. In this way, I can always go on Facebook, create my profile, find all the words down there, because they're all on there, but then select which player I want to provide content moderation for me. If I want to stay with Facebook, I stay with fa Facebook. But what I want is to have options. Uh, no, I just see this, uh, it could be, um, maybe it's easier uh, to accept uh, from a dominant player because you're focusing on one of the services they offer, not the entire ecosystem, if that makes sense. Although it's the one they monetize, so. If not, it's useless. I just wanted to say that all the options are on, on the table and this is the right moment to uh, to talk about this because as we know that there is a new commission, the, the new commission starts to make a plan. Now is the best idea from now for the rest, for the next uh, uh, 12 months uh, to table uh, uh, good ideas. We, we will have time to share more ideas and join efforts. Um, uh, Virginia has already set up um, a file. Well, I think it's actually uh, 
where we can put some notes following this meeting and then to work more on all the initiatives and the issues we have already been um, speaking here. Thanks a lot to everybody. Marco. Uh, it is time to thank our interpreters because I think is. Uh, Il tempo è scaduto per la interpretazione. Uh, I think that we can steal some minutes more, not from the interpreters, of course, but we, with the room uh, for a free discussion without interpretation until the moment in which they will tell us that we have to go. <laughs> yeah, uh, do you agree? Yeah, I don't know. There are contradictory opinions. So <laughs> let's see. That's an interpreter. Thank you. Unfortunately, the time that uh, we foresee for debate uh, with some uh, delay, so we did not uh, uh, have this time during the three hours. But if there are points that some of the participants want to add, uh, of course, without interpretation, you can do it uh, now. Um, I just want to make, uh, to underscore the importance of the intervention of uh, uh, Yannick, uh, tomorrow we will uh, we will uh, talk about this also because uh, it's a, it's a powerful link b between the the issues that we are discussing that we discussed this this afternoon, uh, participation and science. There is also a science of the participation uh, to invest money on how to improve the decision-making process, not only for institutions, but also for citizen participation, is a key issue. It's something that you cannot make out of improvisation or, yeah, or just uh, let uh, people participate. It doesn't work like that. To have uh, a good outcome from civic participation, you need to invest time and money on how this can perform the best. Uh, on uh, which uh, measure you have to take to avoid uh, that uh, uh, the voice that is heard is only the voice of the one who is speaking louder. And very often, the voice of the one who is speaking louder is just the voice of the one who wants to make himself or herself uh, uh, under the spotlight, but maybe is not the most competent or even the most representative of the voice. And sometimes uh, competence is uh, at the margin of a civic uh, discussion. Uh, when there are citizen assemblies of people um, not elected by, but uh, sorted out by, um, uh, uh, strata sorte, uh, sorted out, uh, then when you compose the citizen assemblies with this mechanism, then you need to have a period of uh, a session of uh, um, information of those people. Uh, the dialogue with, uh, uh, with the professional, with experts, and then they can make their mind uh, in uh, discussing among them. But uh, participatory democracy doesn't mean Okay, let's, uh, uh, let's decide uh, in a very chaotic uh, and randomized way. Uh, so even participation, even democracy is a technology. And as any other technology needs scientific improvement sci in scientific investment. So I think this is a, was a, a very powerful link among the things, the issues that we discussed the, this afternoon. Uh, Professor Rama. Ah, oh, thank you. It, you. You talk exactly as Frank West Churchman and Horst Trittel uh, decades ago. You, you just named the most essential things to advance in a discourse, which is anyway difficult, and uh, they, they are written down. <clears throat> uh, you can uh, see my slides and my full text links. It's exactly what they said decades ago. 
but unfortunately these guys are not so well known here. He was a C4 professor in Berkeley and in Stuttgart, but that, that didn't help him. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think your, your presentation really nailed it. And I think my unit on um, under the stewardship of uh, my head of unit, David Mayer, we would be really happy to get further input on, on these sorts of issues. We're going to keep working on it. We have some follow-up projects running, some also uh, related uh, to, to specific uh, additions of online technologies to people uh, people's be, uh, political decision making. So thank you very much for the uh, thank you. I will repeat something that I already said uh, at the beginning, but I think it's important also for our session of tomorrow. Uh, on this specific aspect, I think that one of the outcome of this two days uh, discussion will be to present some proposal that uh, have to become budgetary amendment in the European Union. So when we say equal dignity, uh, for participatory democracy and representative democracy, it means that we have to present amendment to the budget of the European Union to have, for example, equal information on participatory and uh, representative democracy and equal investment on research to uh, improve also participatory democracy. Um, and uh, the second thing that I want to repeat is this idea of a, a platform. Uh, together, we, um, today we mix it together a lot of issues that are not uh, homogeneous, a very heterogeneous uh, discourse during this afternoon. And there are people that can agree with uh, Oh, well, tomorrow we will talk about cannabis legalization, and maybe they do not agree with uh, genome editing on plants, or you can have uh, uh, the contrary, and uh, the same can apply on, uh, on carbon pricing or, or on the rule of law. Um, but still, I think it's very important to link together, to bundle together as much as possible different issues in order to create links between uh, different uh, committee that are in, and campaigns that are proposing specific issues, because this is a way in which we can, uh, we can have the goal of reforming the participatory tool itself, or the tools themselves. Uh, not only European citizen initiatives, but also the petition to European Parliament or uh, the involvement of the European Ombudsman. All these tools are not known. The, in, the European citizens do not know anything about those tools, with few exceptions. So to activate them and to activate them together on very different aspects is a way of uh, fighting to reform them, to reform their effectiveness and to reform the capability of knowledge they can create among uh, European citizens. Uh, and I think this uh, is uh, politically very important and could be a specific value added of the work that we are engaging with this uh, two days um, seminar. Sibylla. I want to only, only say that uh, the importance of the net in the possibility to uh, develop uh, this new way to do politic. Uh, uh, the discussion, the, the new square is on the net. And the, the idea, the rule that is going to be there is uh, supposed to be the new way in which we can connect each other, we can grow from bottom up the, um, the new issue. So that's all. There is uh, any other uh, intervention? There are any other intervention? We can uh, prop can profit from this uh, wonderful room to have a more uh, 
even uh, internal open discussion. <laughs> internal open discussion. Professor Aman. This one. Okay, sorry. Uh, still, I think uh, a real professional discourse needs to go between the people itself and support it by the internet, for sure. The internet uh, is uh, an existing uh, ways and means to communicate and to learn. And one of the most important things about such a discourse which I learned from Horst Rittel is that everybody should come together to formulate a zero hypothesis about what should be debated, not God and the, the devil and the kings, but uh, some topic where you can really agree to make uh, progress and and then it needs a, a long process for to formulate this zero hypothesis and then it needs more than just a happy weekend it needs a lot of work a lot of weeks invested and it needs money it really needs money and and uh, i would be glad to put in uh, the knowledge of Rittel and Churchman uh, decades ago and long forgotten, but not justifiably forgotten. It, uh, they made good progress and uh, I would like to help to, to start. Thank you very much, Klaus. We have to, uh, to go to a conclusion. So, Gila, where we have to go now? So now... So now we are, who wants, but I hope everyone, we are moving to Place Luxembourg, where we are going to um, have a um, get-together that is not exactly a demonstration. is being there at the same time to, in general, meet the people in Place Luxembourg about, uh, and talk about European citizen initiatives, but specifically about carbon pricing. It was mentioned before that the Commission presented the Green New Deal. So since carbon pricing is not mentioned in the Green New Deal, we want to be in front of the European Parliament and um, uh, inform the citizens about the possibility to take part in the mobilization for carbon pricing. I didn't call it a demonstration. Um, it's just being there. Uh, every I also invite you, whilst you leave the room, to take a Science for Democracy gadget, T-shirt, pins, and stuff, for free or with a donation if you want. <laughs> but for free is fine. Donation can be done online. And scienceforddemocracy.org. And uh, for those of you who are joining us tomorrow, we're going to meet here at 9.30 uh, to kick off. As you have seen, we have a lot of panelists, so we will start at 9.30. And for the people online, we are going to live stream from the same channel as, as today. Uh, thanks again for to everyone, attendees, speakers, and uh, let's connect on CryptPad. You have all the links for participating in the uh, follow-up conversation. Today is not didn't aim to be conclusive. It's just a way to kick off a collective process to think about these things together. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>